Hey guys, today we are in for a video on World War I, talking about the course of the war and also the nature of this terrible, terrible conflict. Here are the goals. All right, so let's start by talking about industrial military technology. Uh, so this stuff is important because these new technologies change the nature of warfare and are the reason that World War I is so awful. So the last major war between major European powers was in 1870, the Franco-Prussian War, if you remember. And since 1870, there have been a number of big advances in military technology. One is airplanes. These are useful for scouting and um, also for like very minor sort of bombing raids, but mostly they're important for intelligence. You can fly up there and see what the enemy is doing and fly back down. The machine gun, which was an incredibly effective defensive weapon. Once you had a machine gun set up in a defended place, you could use it to mow down almost any number of enemy troops. Another incredibly effective defensive weapon was the humble barbed wire. And this might seem simple and kind of low tech, but really producing lots and lots of barbed wire had not been possible earlier until the big advances in steel production that happened in the second industrial revolution. And this was really important because with just a little bit of barbed wire, you could make an area almost impassable. Troops would have to stop and cut the wire in order to get through it. And while they stop to cut the wire, you can mow them down with machine guns. And last, and perhaps most inhumanely, uh, we have poison gas. Uh, the chemical industries had taken off uh, between 1870 and 1914, and now you could load poisonous gases up into canisters and shoot them out of cannons and try to poison enemy troops to death with giant clouds of unbreathable and burning gases. Um, so uh, the major upswing of all these technologies is that they were that it made defensive warfare super easy and it made offensive warfare very very difficult, which made it hard to end a war. It made wars usually end in stalemate. And on top of this, the fact that the major nations fighting this war were industrialized meant that they could produce all of this stuff in mass quantities, on top of normal war stuff like cannons and guns and stuff. As a result of this, World War I would become a deadlier war and would last uh, a deadlier war than anybody had ever seen and would last longer than anybody expected. Some World War I um, airplanes. These are um, a couple airplanes fighting each other. So like when one airplane goes up to scout the enemy lines, the other guys send up another airplane to try and shoot that airplane down, leading to the first dogfights. Here's a picture of barbed wire on the left with what appears to be a French troop stuck up there. Um, or maybe, maybe that's German. You can usually tell by like what sort of helmet they're wearing. But so um, you have a, a troop who is stuck in this nest of barbed wire. And on the right, you can see a, uh, a machine gun team wearing gas masks. And so that's a machine gun there. And they are spraying bullets at enemies as that picture is being taken. And here are some pictures uh, that have to do with poison gas. So on the left there, you see two German soldiers and their mule wearing a gas mask to protect themselves from gas attacks. On the right, you see German soldiers charging through um, a cloud of poison gas wearing gas masks uh, toward the enemy. Pretty awful, huh? Can you imagine having to wear that for like days at a time as you're surrounded by a cloud of poison gas? I can't. All right, so let's talk now a little bit about how the war develops. So we left off last time with Germany trying to capture Paris by invading through Belgium according to the Schlieffen plan. And so Germany tries to capture Paris but and gets really close, like really, really close, but is stopped by France at the Battle of Marne, in which there is a total of 500,000 casualties, that is, killed and wounded. Uh, so the German advance is halted and both sides fortify their positions. 
And so basically they dig in, they stretch barbed wire, they build machine gun nests, and these trenches that they dig, basically just big ditches that people can run around in, uh, end up lining all the way from the north coast of France down to the Alps. So there's this huge line of trenches. And um, basically once one side has built a trench, it's very, very hard to break through that trench. But generals on both sides fail to realize that frontal attacks against trenches with machine guns and barbed wire are almost hopeless. And so because generals fail to realize this, we see a series of ineffective and insanely deadly battles occur. The two most infamous are the Battle of Somme, in which one million casualties occur on both, like, both sides combined, and then the Battle of Verdun, in which um, German forces try to capture a French fortress, and uh, in which there is a total of 700,000 casualties. And in each of these battles, there is no gain things stay more or less the same as before the battle. So that's what makes these really huge numbers of casualties seem especially terrifying, is that it's done for seemingly no reason. And what generals eventually realize is that a quick victory through conquest is impossible. You can't just march in and capture the enemy capital. Instead, they develop a, a new concepts of warfare that help them to understand what's going on in World War I. Three new concepts of war that come to dominate the way people think about World War I are the ideas of the war of attrition, total war, and economic war. So a war of attrition um, is basically a type of war where it's impossible to conquer your enemy. And so instead of just trying to capture his capital or whatever, it becomes necessary to fight the enemy until he surrenders out of exhaustion. And so basically, in a war of attrition, whichever side runs out of guns, people, or willpower first, loses. And this means that the war is probably going to be really, really costly to both sides. It's basically just like two sides punching each other in the face until one side passes out. A concept that comes out of this idea of war, the war of attrition is the concept of total war. And in a total war, this means that all of the nation's resources are turned toward the war effort. And so not just soldiers are part of the war, but every citizen of a nation is supposed to contribute to the war in some way or another. Some people go to fight as soldiers, other people work in factories making guns or uh, shells or tanks or whatever. And all of the nation's industrial capacity and farming capacity goes to supply the army. So the entire nation is turned towards producing stuff for war. And this idea of total war leads us to the last big concept, and that is economic warfare. And so when a nation's total economy is used to support a war, if you want to beat that nation, one way to beat them is to hurt their economy. And you can do this by cutting off an enemy's access to vital resources. And you can do this to slow their industrial production or to starve the enemy population. England does this to Germany by using its superior navy to cut Germany off from overseas trade. And they also go on to conquer all of Germany's colonies, which are supplying vital raw materials. Uh, Germany does the same thing to Britain, and it relies on U-boats, that is, Unterseeboten, or... Uh, submarines in order to destroy British shipping. And what they're doing is they're attempting to destroy all of Britain's cargo ships in order to starve Britain and force them to leave the war. All three of these concepts result in war that is incredibly costly and deadly and leads to an unprecedented amount of suffering, suffering beyond anything anybody could have ever imagined before the war broke out. And so the war is dragging on, and it is incredibly costly to both sides. And Germany is continuing with its economic warfare against Britain, and is using its U-boats to sink supply ships going to Britain and France. And um, one consequence of this is that uh, the United States ends up getting sucked into the war. So from 1914 to 1917, the United States remains neutral, but it does want to trade with Britain and France. And since Germany is trying to starve Britain and France out of the war by blocking all of their shipping, 
uh, they start to sink U.S. trading vessels that insist on trading with Britain and France. And this obviously makes the United States angry, but they get really angry when a German U-boat sinks a British passenger ship on which there are hundreds of U.S. citizens who die. And as a result of this, um, Germany stops for a time because it really doesn't want to make the United States angry. Uh, but eventually it resumes U-boat uh, activity and starts sinking more American ships. And finally the United States has had enough and it declares war on Germany in 1917. And the United States uh, is able to supply so many men and so many materials that they start to tip the scale in favor of the Allies and against Germany and the other central powers. On the other front, the Eastern Front, where Austria and Germany are fighting Russia, there um, things are going a little bit better for the central powers. Um, in fact, uh, trench warfare never really develops on this front so much, and Germany and Austria are able to push back the poorly equipped Russian army. And uh, Russia's been getting pushed back and pushed back uh, further and further, and German troops are closing in on the Russian capital. And uh, at this point, Russian morale is super low, and the economy is in tatters, and the people of Russia are suffering. And this is the perfect time for a revolution, right? The people are angry, they want something new. And this is the time when the Russian communist revolutionary leader, Vladimir Lenin, um, leads a successful uprising against the Russian government. And he's able to win over the Russian populace with the slogan, Peace, Land, and Bread. And uh, so Lenin takes over and he is able to secure peace by pulling Russia out of the war but only by giving up a whole bunch of Russian territory to Germany and Austria. Uh, basically, that whole big uh, blue, red, and green chunk is land that Russia loses, giving up to the Central Powers. Okay, so when Russia exits the war, things are looking better for Germany and Austria, but not great. And that's because even though the Russia has dropped out, a much stronger party has joined against them, and that is the United States. And so in the summer of 1918, the British, the French, and the U.S. are able to launch a successful offensive to break through the German trenches on the Western Front. But so how is it possible that they are finally breaking through the trenches in 1918, when before it was impossible? Well, there were two big things. Uh, now, the United States has been giving enough manpower to the, to the Allies that they have a significant advantage in numbers over the Germans. And second, the British and French have pioneered the use of armored vehicles called tanks. And these tanks are originally used to break through um, the enemy trenches. They're immune to machine gun fire, mostly, and uh, foot soldiers can follow along behind these armored tanks to get across the area known as no man's land. The tanks can also, of course, drive right over barbed wire. And so with this extra manpower and with tanks, uh, Britain, France, and the United States are able to basically break through the German line. And the Germans all through the summer and fall are falling back, falling back towards Germany until eventually um, the line collapses altogether. And at this point, uh, the German leadership realizes that the army is beaten and that it's only a matter of time until it collapses entirely, and so they call for an armistice in November of 1918. And so the war is not officially over at that point, but that's when the fighting ends, and Germany and Austria are beaten, Britain, France, and Italy and the United States and all their other little allies have won. And now what's left to do is to put the pieces back together because Europe is in tatters and nobody is really sure exactly how to rebuild society after this catastrophic four year long slaughter. Happy note, I will leave you with these questions. We will see you guys in a day or two to learn about uh, all this stuff in more detail.